Hello, this is David J. Howe, Doctor Who collector and author. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Keep collecting. Welcome back to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, the podcast that explores the hardbound world of Doctor Who collecting, all the collectors, and all kinds of Doctor Who merchandise, and brought to you, of course, by Forbidden Planet and Bags Unlimited Incorporated. I am Larry Van Mersbergen, your host. I've been a Doctor Who collector now for 42 years. Welcome to our 65th episode. We are celebrating the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who this year. So, Moving right along, and you might know the story already, but um, I opened up one of the first Doctor Who stores in Chicago, and in 1984, I was uh, 15 years old, and I thought I made one of the most ridiculous suggestions to myself that I thought I would ever make, and that is I was going to open up a Doctor Who store, because I managed through my correspondence with friends in England and Scotland that they would help me buy Doctor Who items, and they said, there's loads of this stuff in all these used bookstores and thrift shops and whatnot. And literally the, you know, Royal Mail wasn't that bad. It just took a long time to get here. And uh, they were perfectly happy just accepting what they paid for it and the postage. I even said, I'll pay for your petrol. <laughs> and I even knew the term. And they said, no, no, that's fine. It's just down the street. I can do this easy. I said, it's no problem. We got plenty of that stuff here. Well, Today, it's a different story. Uh, nobody's uh, got bunches of stuff in in thrift stores for pennies on the throw. It's all hundreds of, sometimes thousands of dollars. But that's how we did it. And I started it. It was called Bundles from Britain. And it took off. It actually became a legitimate company. And the only reason I mention that is it discovered many years later that in a great book called Red, White, and Who, the story of Doctor Who in America, Bundles from Britain is on page 384. Part of history. I had to contemplate that for a while to realize what, what that meant, but what an amazing thing. And I am also good friends with the authors of that wonderful book, and you can find a link to buy it on the front page of our website at DoctorWhoCollectors.com. Um, it is available directly from the publisher. It's uh, ATB Publishing, and uh, they still have the second printing in stock. We are part of the Direction Point Doctor Who Podcast Network, and you can find some wonderful Doctor Who podcasts at directionpoint.org. And if you happen to be a listener here and you host a podcast and you're not part of this network, that's another good decision you could make today. And so you can join the ranks of podcasts such as Time Streams, Police Box in a Junkyard, the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, Traveling the Vortex, Doctor Who Literature, oh, so many more that it would take me a lot longer of my time to, uh, to list. But just go to directionpoint.org and check out all the great podcasts that are there. Um, there you go. Uh, speaking of links, of course, every episode I include these wonderful links because you don't have to start with episode one. You can start with episode 65. And if you're a new listener, welcome to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. So our first link is timelash.com. And under that heading, select the TARDIS library. And that's to keep track of your books, your vinyl, your Betamax, your whatever, your media items. It will not help you with your figurines or your Funko Pops, but these are the printed media, like books, uh, no magazines, unfortunately, but uh, they do have audio um, and video and vinyl and sound and all that wonderful stuff. So you can find that all there. Uh, and that if you want to find uh, something that you're not sure is a Doctor Who collectible or want to find out more about Doctor Who collectibles that are beyond what Timelash has to offer, then you need to get to the toy box. 
and I mean Howe's Transcendental Toy Box at DoctorWhoToyBox.co.uk. And in Howe, I mean David J. Howe, a familiar name with most Doctor Who people. He's a wonderful friend of mine and a great resource for collectors. Of course, you can contribute to this archive as well, and it will be approved by one of the many moderators, myself included. So there you go. Of course, if you're looking for great Doctor Who items at great prices, look no further than DoctorWhoStore.com. <clears throat> it's in the name. And that's Alien Entertainment. And if you're in the Chicago area, they've got two locations to serve your collecting needs. And of course, the one, the main store in downtown Lombard on Main Street. Um, and of course, the new store in Logan Square on Milwaukee Avenue. So they're constantly running sales, and the owner, Gene Smith, we, he and I go back to 1984. He helped me with Bundles from Britain. We became partners back in the day. Now he owns that company, and uh, he's, uh, a great, he's always buying collections, so there's always something going on there. You can also find great Doctor Who items at Forbidden Planet, one of our sponsors. We are still working on our website to fix the links to the, the items. Their embed links are not working at the moment, so we will get that fixed as soon as possible. But as soon as it does, I will let you know. And don't forget our own eBay store. We do have a lot of Target books. Over 200 Target books came in that... I already have, so they got to go somewhere, and we price them to go. So we want other collectors to be able to get them. Uh, so just go to our website at DrWhoCollectors.com, click on Merchandise Links, and that'll take you to our eBay store. All proceeds benefit the podcast. And of course, in addition to all the podcasts that I have published since the beginning, and you can go back to number one on the website. I don't know if Apple will let you go back that far, but at least our website will. Um... I have the complete guide to Doctor Who hardcovers uh, that is also there, and it's uh, we list a lot of reprints, and we're still doing research with other other authors to help them get a complete guide to what's been published in Doctor Who. Next on our list here is Chicago TARDIS 2023, set for next November Thanksgiving weekend. That'll be the 60th anniversary uh, convention. And so for more information, go to chicagotardis.com. What's going on with me? Well, I had I will talk more about this in my time, but I was at Consinity 2023 last Saturday, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and I hope to be back next year. Uh, my next event, and this is exciting, and this is something I'm very, very excited about. I am a guest at Doctoberfest 2023 in Indianapolis. I know more people now that are going to go to this event because... It's not just me on the marquee here. I'm being joined on the marquee by none other than Sophie Aldred. I am joining ACE at this convention. I am super stoked. And um, I reached out to uh, Sophie on Facebook and she wrote back to me. I was very excited about that. So she's excited to be in Indianapolis as well. Uh, more information coming soon. As I get it, I will share it, of course, on our social media pages and our website. So details on those tickets are coming soon as well. I will have a dedicated room with my collection on display. So if you've always wanted to see what's in the Who Room, I'm taking it on the road. Um, and uh, we will have a great time. I think I might be joined by our good friend Katie Haynes, who will be in full cosplay and doing TikToks throughout the entire event just to help promote what we're doing there. I'm also confirmed now to be a guest at the Twin, Twin Cities console room in 2024, and that's uh, still to be... Um, you know, kind of hammered up there. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be making it at Gallifrey One in 2024, so watch this space for um, possible panels there. New to the collection, I need to make a quick correction here in the last episode. I, I declared that the Dalek Invasion of Earth Radio Times was the first Doctor Who cover, and I knew better <laughs> that it wasn't. Um, the first cover, of course, was February 64 for Marco Polo. That's a more difficult one to find. Mine was November 64. I'm in the same uh, year. Uh, I want to thank my good friend Edwin Patterson for the information. I'm going to be seeing my good friend Edwin Patterson uh, this coming weekend. He's, coming, he's in the United States, and I said, hey, if you're in Chicago, uh, give me a, a, a buzz and he did and so I'm going to be talking to him we might record a little bit of our conversation you never know um, and by the way also I want a, a special thanks here to my good friend Stephen Warren Hill uh, I now have a complete set of books published by the Aeonian and Ameronian publisher of which some of those books existence was in doubt I can now verify that the five books do exist 
Um, the only book that doesn't is a book on Genesis of the Daleks. So my next podcast episode after this one, we're going to focus on those books, even though I've covered them and I will continue to cover them as part of the hardcover um, coverage. But I think they deserve their own um, show because in Red, White and Who, they actually interviewed the owner of the company to find out more about what this was. And we can share that with you. Um, and it'll, it'll be called, I say Aeonian, you say Amaronian. <laughs> And let's call it, let's call the whole thing off. Okay, well, maybe that. I don't know. We'll see. I don't think I can get away with that. Anyway, um, I will do that on our next episode. So um, I also received uh, an, un an unopened, unopened set of Series 11 and 12 trading cards. Nice to find those if you can find them at a reasonable cost. Um, I found uh, one online, I think it was for a hundred and something dollars, and this was a lot less than that. So, And that's all for that for now. So stay tuned for more updates on the collection. Um, and still, many, many rumors about on the, this whole thing with Doctor Who classic hardcovers. It gets a lot of people's um, hair turned up and they get really, really animated. Uh, especially when you talk about a second or third printing. Um, there are rumors about, about many third printings, and so far we've only been able to prove the existence of one hardcover book that made it to three printings, and that's the Loch Ness Monster. And the only reason I can verify that is I have a third printing in mint condition on my shelf. Unfortunately, I don't have a first or a second, which appears to be even more difficult to find. Um, but anyway, if you have a book, especially we're looking for Brain of Morbius, second edition that one came up a few times that was actually uh that caused a lot of, of of talking when i announced it on one of the episodes uh because i do have it in one source uh however there is no photographic proof that the book existed so we're waiting on that if you have a a copy of brandon morbius and hardcover on your shelf in whatever condition take a gander at the copyright page and see if it says reprinted at all or second impression those are the the things you're looking for so just share it with us here at Doctor Who Collectors Podcast at gmail.com. On today's show, it is today my continuing coverage of Doctor Who Classic Hardcovers, this year covering the 1982 publication year. Not a stellar year. Not a lot of books came out, and even fewer Target books came out. Um, but I will include my stellar guest, Mr. Tony Witt, the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast host and producer and a dear friend. Feedspot, of course, they rank podcasts of all kinds and shapes and sizes, and they have a top 90 list for Doctor Who podcasts. And so far for 2023 at this uh, juncture, we are number 35 in the top 90. We dropped a couple spots, but that's okay. We're still in a good position there. I like to be in the in the kind of the not quite the upper third, but close. Um and so thank you for your listening support. Uh, keep supporting us, and uh, we will um, hopefully rise on that list. A lot of Direction Point Network podcasts high up on that list. Thank you for that. I also want to thank our patrons. If you would like to see exclusive material, including the video interviews I do or the video um, of Zoom calls that we do with uh, with Tony. Even though Tony doesn't appear on it, you get to see the hardcovers. So that might be something you're into. Or the interview I did with Sadie Miller or with Peter Purvis even. Um, some wonderful stuff. Just go to our Patreon page and subscribe at the $15 level. It's not a lot. In fact, subscribe for 15 and then quit the next month or whatever you however you want to do it. Um, to find us, go to patreon.com backslash Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, all one word. You can support us also at one of our primary pod, uh, podcast outlets, and that's Podbean, doctorwhocollectors.podbean.com. And you can click the Become a Patron button and support us at any level you feel comfortable. Um, in fact, I just noted that if all of my social media followers went to Podbean and pledged a dollar we would be able to pay our bills for the entire six months. If you stayed on for two months, we would have our bills covered for a year. So I'm just thinking about that. You know, that's all we do with it. I'm not here to get rich. I have a day job. I'm very happy. I want to educate you on how to collect Doctor Who and what's out there. So there you go. Our theme song, of course, is Who's Doctor Who, composed by Barry Mason and Les Reed, performed by Fraser Hines, a friend of the podcast. If you want to share this podcast with your friends, and I hope you do, we are out there, including Apple Podcasts, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and Podbean. We're pretty much everywhere except for Spotify. 
And of course, you can find us at directionpoint.org. That's the network where all of the podcasts live. Now it's time for my time. My time is a chance to talk about anything I want to, because it's my podcast. There you go. Um, I want to talk basically about how wonderful a time I had at Consinity. Consinity is the Gathering of the Geeks at uh, Dirks Hall at the uh, Milwaukee School of Engineering University up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, it's organized by students, uh, and it was great to uh, be invited as a guest, which uh, was was very nice. Um, I did have a table there. We had some of our Target books uh, for sale and some other goodies. We did we did sell a few things, so we've got some bills paid for for now. So that's good. Um, I did a, uh, a session on Doctor Who, the, the Doctor Who Collector Showcase, which is my new show, and uh, it's nice to hear when someone says, "Hey, I've never seen that before." And uh, one of my good friends was in the audience. Uh, Mr. John Lavely is a great guy. Um, and he said he had never seen the White Lion uh, books before. Those are the books that have Tom Baker on the front cover, but they're William Hartnell stories. Uh, and from what I understand, and I may do this on a separate podcast, although I don't know if it's necessary, but it was marketing. You know, they didn't want to confuse the uh, consumer by putting a white haired uh, doctor on the front cover when the doctor on TV has uh, uh, long teeth and curls, all teeth and curls, as they say. So they put Tom Baker's picture on the cover, even though inside the book, and especially in the Zarbi, I believe there's a line that says, and a man with great white hair stepped out of the TARDIS. So they didn't edit the books at all. Those are the same uh, books that were the same text that was printed in the original Muller editions, and White Lion got a hold of those. That's why um, Doctor Who and the Daleks never got a classic hardcover. Later, uh, and I don't think you get the Zarbi either, for that matter, but you do get the Crusaders much later. So I'm not sure why that was done, but, you know, we'll figure that out when we get to that point. Uh, we get to that book in the uh, podcast. I'll let you know because I'll do the research. Um, no, it was a great time. I also uh, sat on a panel on what's the future of Doctor Who like, and it was run, um, our moderator, uh, Dr. Stacy Smith, author with ATB Publishing, wonderful, wonderful gal. Um, also, Stephen Warren Hill. As we all know, Mike Olson, who's a staff member at Chicago TARDIS, and my good friend Rob Rob Warnock, who's a uh, also a Doctor Who fan as well as a fellow musician. So it was really great to see that. And also my good friend Nick Seidler, who's the faculty advisor to the uh, MSOE Consinity program. It was just really nice to, to be there. A lot of great people stopped at the booth. I saw a lot of amazing costumes. I, of course, wore my Dr. Five. Got a lot of compliments on that as well. Um, and also special thanks to the Milwaukee Time Lords. That group's been around for a long time and a wonderful group of people. They go back a long way and they still celebrate Doctor Who, which is, you know, how I got started in all this all those years ago. Uh, in 83, I discovered fan clubs and I joined two. Um, I was part of the Emissaries of the White Guardian in Skokie and the Many Companions of Doctor Who in Chicago. Uh, emissaries disappeared and um, I stayed with Many Companions and that led to bundles from Britain. And that's, uh, you know, the, the Many Companions of Doctor Who is where I met Gene Smith. He was a member of that club. Um, we also had uh, um, award-winning author Rhonda Del Bacchio. If you don't know her, Google her. She's got some amazing books published, but she was a part of our club as well. Um, fan clubs are a very important part of this experience. You know, I, I belong to the Doctor Who Appreciation Society off and on. Um, and then, of course, the Doctor Who Fan Club of America, too. I, I put in a membership for that as well. Um, that I didn't keep up with for very long. And then, of course, they're no longer in existence as well. So there were a lot of groups out there just to just to do that. But it's nice that the Milwaukee Time Lords have a home with Consinity. And I think they were looking into a bigger um, science fiction convention. At least there was a session on that. I, I had to leave uh, around five o'clock, so I <clears throat> did not get to see it. And uh, um, sorry about my voice, but I'm a teacher by day job, so I've already talked all day. So I'm going to talk and do my podcast. So there we go. Sometimes if I get to do this early in the morning, I have a different voice. So there you go. Anyway, uh, that's what's really uh, exciting about doing these conventions is you get to see your old friends and you get to see many new people, many new friends sometimes. 
picked up a few new listeners, people picking up the uh, the flyers and, you know, scanning the QR code or watching the slideshows. It's, it's really nice. You know, we've had a lot of great people on this podcast. You know, we've had David J. Howe on the podcast. We've had Peter Purvis on the podcast. Um, so, I mean, we are uh, a force to be reckoned with now, which is really nice. I, I started this off for fun and now I do it as a passion. So it's quite a, quite an amazing uh, journey for me, especially with the th- 30th, uh, 30th, gosh, I'm old. Anyway, the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who. So, you know, that's coming up too with, uh, we got specials coming up in uh, in November and the new Doctor coming out shortly after that. Um, hopefully with a Christmas uh, episode again, I think that might be part of it. Um, we're looking forward to new episodes being animated again, which is really exciting. Uh, so we could see some of these lost episodes uh, come back to life with the original audio and with the... Uh, animation. So that's always great too. Uh, the, uh, you know, as far as, uh, as far as that goes, you know, fandom is, a, it's been a lot of fun. I've been watching Doctor Who now for 48 years and it's, it's like one of those things, you know, how many shows did you watch as a kid that you're still watching today? I mean, yeah, I like the $6 million man, but it, when it came on, but it stopped. Um, I enjoyed the man from uncle too, but that stopped. Uh, the, uh, I'm trying to think of a few more Battlestar Galactica was great. Well, then they rebooted it and I didn't like the reboot. So, uh, sorry if I offended anybody Battlestar Galactica fans, but I didn't like the reboot. I like the original, but that stopped too. But I, I hardly ever watch those anymore, but I still will turn on BritBox and I'll, I'll say, oh, Mind of Evil or a Pluto TV will have a, a streaming Doctor Who story. I'm like, oh, Kinda Part 4. Let's tune that in. And you can always just sit down and watch it. It's just a lot of fun. Watching Doctor Who is what brought me here to you. I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but it did. Anyway, coming up, I've got the main story and the most outrageous offer. Yes, we've got a book that reaches a a limit that I don't think it should because I found it cheaper. Usually if I can find it cheaper, it's outrageous. So there you go. Um, We'll be right back after these few words from Direction Point Network Podcast. So stay tuned. Are you ready to travel through time with us? Then check out Traveling the Vortex, a Doctor Who podcast. For nearly seven years and more than 500 episodes, we've traveled from one end of the vortex to the other, making different stops with different doctors, reviewing everything from TV stories to audio plays, from books to comics, and more. Sean, Keith, and Glenn take you on a journey through 50-plus years of Doctor Who episodes and spinoff materials. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, so be sure to check us out. And now, we're a proud member of Direction Point, a Doctor Who podcast network. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Keep collecting. We are going on a journey, a very long journey, through the world of the Target novelizations and publication order. Every week, we are looking at a new book, talking about Terrace Dix, Malcolm Hulk, and all our Doctor Who novelization friends. Whatever you do, keep turning the pages. This is Jason Miller of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast, a member of the Direction Point Podcast Network, and you are listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Keep collecting. Hi, I'm Juliet. And I'm Nathan. Experience Doctor Who from the very beginning through a classic fan's eyes. And through the eyes of a new Who fan. Reminisce and relive those classic moments with Nathan as he offers fun insight. Or experience them for the first time with Juliet as she dwells on social issues, history, fashion, and the size of a flashlight. We're the Time Streams Podcast. Find us on Spotify, Stitcher, or Apple Podcasts. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Keep collecting. Up there is the scanner. Those are the doors. That is a chair with a panda on it. Sheer poetry, dear boy. And now it's time for our main story. This is a continuation of our coverage of the classic Doctor Who hardcovers that we've done now for a few episodes here and there. And uh, we've been covering 1974 through 1981, covering the imprints of Universal Tandem, which included the labels of Alan Wingate, Longbow, and W.H. Allen. Uh, Today's show, we start in 1981, where the W.H. Allen imprint is used exclusively. Not a very robust year, as only nine books were published, 
and compared only with eight Target paperbacks published the same year. So new stories and reprints of, uh, not exactly reprints, but reissuing of old stories in hardcover will cover this one. Um, and the only other new book that comes out this year is the Doctor Who quiz book. So again, uh, since you can start this at any level of podcast, you don't have to start at the first one. You can start here and work your way back. Let me give you that brief history. And by the way, the brief history is going to be very important in today's episode. So if you're listening, there might be a quiz on it later. Um, in 1975, Universal Tandem was sold by the UPD conglomerate to the British company Howard & Wyndham. Then the company was renamed Tandem Publishing before merging with the paperback imprints of Howard and Wyndham's general publishing house, W.H. Allen, to become Wyndham Publications Limited in 1976. Of course, the very next year, they phased out the Wyndham identity completely. The Tandem imprint was phased out completely in 1980. And all surviving titles from that backlist were reprinted under W.H. Allen's principal paperback imprint, Star Books. The Target imprint survives until 1993, though in the later years, it is used exclusively for Doctor Who novelizations. And in the last couple of years, the BBC has bought the Target imprint for newer Target books. The W.H. Allen imprint is used on all hardcover books until the run ends in 1988. Of course, anytime I mention the words Doctor Who and novelization in the same sentence, I am required by the threat of Ace with a Bat next to me here to include our resident Doctor Who novel specialist, the host and producer of the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, my good friend, Tony Witt. Welcome back, Tony. Now, you know that Ace would never knock your eye stock off. <laughs> no, and, and and I wanted to bring her in because I just found out today, and I may, and I may have posted this already, but... I'm going to be a guest with her at Doctoberfest. Oh my God! Really? I was like, I I was like, wait, wait, wait. I, I talked to Kevin, who's the owner at Who North America. And I said, I said, so I get top billing, right? He goes, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. But no. you are you are still a guest, and you're going to be with Sophie uh, Aldred. So, uh, so this was even more strange, but. I got a Facebook message from her and saying, Hey, oh. I heard you were going to be on this con. Like, what are, what do you do? And it's all, and so I got to tell her about what I do and what I am. I said, I'm not a doctor who actor. So let me get that out of the way. Uh, but this is what I've done. She goes, that is super cool. I can't wait to see all that. I'm like, Oh, oh that is so, so kind. Uh, and so uh, that, that, you know, I, I'm just, I'm thinking, wow, what a, you know, and I've had, I've had great experiences with doctor who actors. I've also had, terrible experiences with doctor who actors <laughs> but the most part i mean i'll tell you what the, the nicest people that i have i've talked to are like most of the you know all the big finnish people are great uh peter purvis was an absolute gem uh and sophie aldred of course my friend katie manning i've known her since 84 so you know it's just great to know all those wonderful people um so anyway uh we're into 1981 here and they only published nine books which kind of tells you the writings on the wall mm -hmm. we're not making a whole lot of money on this particular venture but you know fandom is still going so we'll do nine but at the same time only eight target books came out that year mm -hmm. and this is some, something of a of a of an alarm bell because they they started to kind of think okay where are we going with this of course the paperbacks survive a little bit further into the future up to 93 i believe and then um that's when things kind of like swirled the drain doctor who wise so um this year we have no hardcover reprints in fact you won't see another reprint until 1985 and then that will be that and there's a very special reason for that reprint which we'll get to when we get to that year which could be a year or two from now because we can only cover the books that the doctor who target book club has covered on their podcast so we all and we're slow and that's okay <laughs> you guys can take your time because i i love the fact that i can spread these out because these are the most listened to episodes oh so great. i i can kind of get uh the, the momentum going. So anyway, listeners, uh, these hardcovers are very sought after, extremely sought after and getting more sought after. The, the drama behind Doctor Who hardcovers has, is always something that kind of reminds me that the fact that I teach high school, it's the same kind of thing. People behave in the same way. Um, so 
you might have to be a paid off witness to afford these <laughs> so, <laughs> kind of if, if that applies to you, um, which, uh, by the way, you have to get your lawyer to uh, mortgage their house and uh, <laughs> funnel it through a shell company. And, uh, you know, you know how that goes. Anyway, uh, these books, of course, can be found in a couple different ways. Um, most commonly, the older books are found in X library condition, which is either pulled, withdrawn or stolen from a library. <laughs> and in some cases, they have been stolen from libraries. Uh, or what we call a non-library edition or a retail version, which is either something that was bought at a store or a publisher copy or a publisher review copy. Um, you may have, uh, see, I don't know if you heard this story, Tony, but recently on my website, a, a, a person contacted me find asking about value of books. This person was the grandson of a guy who worked at WH Allen, and he had mint publisher copies of all of the first early run hardcovers. And he sold them for 14,000 pounds. Oh, God. He says he doesn't have to worry about saving up for the addition on his house now. <laughs> so I was like, mint copies of Auton Invasion and Seeds of Doom and all these early. He said that, you know, dad would just bring them home from work. I'm like, wow. Okay. <laughs> Of course, that's the other way you could get these books. I And I was not told, I was not allowed to know who bought them, but I was told it was somebody that worked in the BBC. Oof. So somebody had that kind of money to spend. So there you go. Um, also, many of the titles we're going to talk about tonight were distributed in the United States, uh, but not until four years later. So 1985. And that's an interesting story. I've told it many times, but that happened to be me. <laughs> <laughs> was the owner of bundles from Britain. And we, we got all of the surviving hardcovers from Lyle Stewart. So, um, and in fact, I, I've made some corrections to people to say, uh, wait, that book's not worth as much. Uh, Cause if you bought it in San Francisco, that means they got it from me. <laughs> and so that's um, very few of them made it to the bookstores here. Uh, so in 1982, Tony, I, I hate to put you on the spot, but any, any memories of 82 that spring to mind? Oh, 1982. I think 1982, in fact, I know for a fact that 1982 is the first time I ever heard that Adric was going to die. Mm. And I had the big surprise of Earthshock spoiled for me yeah. all in one evening because I went to an academy for gifted and talented students over the summer and mm. met another Doctor Who fan who I still know to this day. And he he spoiled all of the new season for me because at that point it was still a new season. And it's like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> so when I saw wow. Earthshock, which we're discussing on the next episode of the podcast, right, right. I had already had all of the major surprises uh, completely spoiled for me. Now, for me, of course, it was knowing that the Cybermen were involved because they're not in the title. Right. So that was kind of a complete shock as well. And I, I'm trying to remember, I don't think I saw the Davisons in 82 because I think I mentioned on the last time we talked when Chicago bought everything, we bought the like the premiere package, which included the John Pertwee, the entire Baker run. And they decided to go all the way back to the beginning. <laughs> and so we had to sit through all the Pertwee episodes, all the Baker episodes again, one week at a time. So it took another, I think, till 83 until we saw the first, until we saw Castro Velva on, on WTTW. Um, but as far as uh, for me in 82, of course, that would be the, the a year ago in 81, I actually bought my first Doctor Who items. In 82, I had amassed already a pretty decent collection because I discovered a place in Chicago called Larry's Comic Book Store and Annex. They used to be on the corner of Devon and Broadway. And I do remember um, learning how to use the CTA at that time to take, I took the 97 bus to the, what they called the, back then it was called the Howard run. Now it's called the red line. Um, and you took that to three stops to Loyola, got off, walked about a block and you were at Devon and Broadway. Oh. And there was this, this guy behind the counter with the slick back hair, this little mustache who just kind of glowered at everybody as they walked in the door. And if you stood looking at a magazine too long, uh, somebody would come up and say, Hey, this isn't a lending library. <laughs> <laughs> and then fast forward, I learned later that he is, he is partly a uh, inspiration for comic book guy on the Simpsons, the Ooh. character. Uh, but the voice is uh, Harry Shearer's college roommate. <laughs> 
<laughs> so because the the roommate would give rules like there will be no loud music at this time <laughs> you know but but the 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 actual and now larry was not a fat guy like they made the comic book guy really fat but larry was like rail thin so they oh, wow. went to full extreme um i've i've spoken to larry in recent years he's mellowed quite a bit he's a super nice guy in fact he probably was back then but he was irritated by kids like me coming into the store and that was the first time i saw early target books because he had them all behind the counter with the block logos and and i was like can i see those he goes can i see your money <laughs> and i had money with me a day so I, I took out what i had he goes okay you can look <laughs> and even 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 a funnier story he did that to gene smith once gene wanted to buy oh, all geez. three all three of the trout and annuals were in the uh display case and he goes i'd like to take all three of those he goes i don't think you can afford them <laughs> now many people don't know this but Gene's occupation before uh, Doctor Who, he was a locksmith and one of the best ones in Chicago. So Oof. he owned his own company. He he had plenty of money. That's why he invested in bundles from Britain. He's, he could do it. So he pulls out his wallet and he pulls out several hundred dollar bills and Larry's <laughs> like, okay, all right. <laughs> and he bought all three of them right then and there. That was, uh, and the other thing I remember too is behind the counter, there was a, there was a, it was a, a, a set of rules that were taped to the wall with brown packing tape that said no paper bag for a purchase under $10, no change <laughs> given unless purchase is made. <laughs> oh my goodness. And so it was all these rules, but he had, and by the way, the place was a dump. You walked in the door <laughs> and everything was in like boxes. So all the doctor who weeklies were scrunched into a box and oh. on the floor were star Trek comics. And then he had, um, and then, of course, you went next door and next door to that was the annex. And there was another guy working there who was super calm, super nice. And the place was all neat and organized. And and that were that's where all the comic back cover back issues were. But um, but I will give Larry Sherrod credit because he is officially credited with returning Terror of the Autons in color off a of Betamax that he recorded off a of TV. Oh, and that's how they use the print on that to make Terror of the Autons in color today. So, wow. <laughs> pretty cool anyway uh here's what's happening here's what happened in 1982 with doctor who so in january of 1982 chicago moves doctor who to sunday nights at 11 o'clock that's most of my memory as a child was uh begging my parents to stay up late on sunday and they said as long as you get yourself up for school next morning we don't care so i never missed a day of school on a monday anyway so but it was the first time they showed omnibus movies before that they were doing uh every day from 5 30 to 6 uh, they would do one episode so they moved it there uh in march 21st members of the doctor who fan club of america raised funds for the krma PBS station and by june of 82 the club had 1200 members in three months it climbed to 3000 members uh, I joined, I think, right around that time as well. It was the largest Doctor Who fan club organization in the world. And by February of 83, it went up to 7,500 members. And it had one of the most incredible relationships with the BBC and Lionheart. So it was able to produce its own line of licensed merchandise, including T-shirts, badges, and publications. Uh, the fanzine, of course, was the Whovian Times. And I have a few issues of those in the collection. Um in June of 1982, Variety magazine features a front ad page ad for the 41 Tom Baker omnibus serials, calling it a sci-fi film festival. <laughs> the ad also publicized the upcoming Panopticon West convention, which uh, you were, I don't think you were in Chicago in that time, but we, mm -hmm. that was the, that was the convention we lovingly called SweatCon. <laughs> Because in July 16th, the 18th, 1982, Panopticon West at uh, in Chicago uh, featured John Nathan Turner, uh, announced 20 markets had pre-purchased the 78 Peter Davison episodes, the equivalent of three seasons of 26 episodes, which were available in January of 83. These markets included Stamford, uh, and by the way, they don't know which Stamford it was. <laughs> <laughs> it could be anyone. It's like Springfield and the Simpsons. It could be anywhere. Uh, Kansas City, Nashville, Charlotte, Schenectady, Wilmington, and Winston-Salem. Um, at the Americana Congress Hotel on that wonderful 100-degree day, the AC broke. Oh, So it was 
very warm and some of and and of course this is these are this is a convention well before uh anybody wore costumes so we were basically i was in t-shirt and shorts anyway but it was uncomfortably warm um poor tom baker had had a, like a white shirt on and he was like oh, man this is hot they kept bringing water and stuff but um if you go to if you look this convention up on any website it is in quotes sweat con so, uh, of course, this site of this particular hotel, the Americana Congress, now the Continental Congress, I think, uh, was the site of many future creation conventions. Uh, in October of 82, KRMA airs Once Upon a Time Lord with actual film footage from that SWATCON convention. And by the end of 82, in December, Lionheart announces that Doctor Who is now watched by 9 million viewers in the United States, and membership in the Doctor Who Fan Club of America continues to grow to 10,000. So there you go. I was still in middle school in 1982, So, uh, but believe it or not, in two years from now, from that 82 time, I would open up bundles from Britain. So there you go. I was watching Doctor Who. I didn't join a fan club until 84. So that was, uh, yeah, quite a year. So, mm -hmm. okay. So getting to the main meat of our program here, are the books in 1982, all the Doctor Who hardcovers will be W.H. Allen. They will be issued with um, a laminate cover. Sometimes they're well done. Sometimes they look like they're pasted on. So um, all will feature the Neon or Sutton logo at this point in time. So we start in January of 1982, and the first book off the uh, presses was Doctor Who and the Demons by Barry Letts. The cover, by the way, is by Andrew Skilleter, and it's a beautiful cover. The, the Azale, Azal is drawn really well here. Uh, 3,000 copies were printed, and the book had a price of £4.95. Now, if we convert that with inflation, that would be about $20.57. This book, actually not very hard to find, but for some reason, it's getting a lot of money. So the last time I looked this up, someone was offering this book for $1,100. <laughs> for a copy in non-library condition. Now, this particular copy um, is from the USA distribution in 1986. <laughs> so this is the copy I got from Bundle. So it is still in complete mint and very tight condition. So I'm hoping that one day this will lead to retirement. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> anyway, um, that was, uh, so we did. Actually, it sold at Bundles for night for $15 back in the day. So there you go. Uh, so what did the Target Book Club think of this novel? I know this goes back a ways for you. It does. It goes back to episode 58. And we had Jennifer Picker on oh, for yeah, that my, one. Our good friend Jennifer. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, there are three uh, from this group that had Jennifer Picker on. Uh, oh, she good. gave it a 4.5. I think this is the first time we had her on, in fact. So she gave it a 4.5. Uh, Allison gave it a 3. In fact, Allison gives some of these novels her highest scores. So this is a bumper year, in fact. Wow. She said there were strong feelings all around for this particular book for some reason. Dalton gave it a 4.5, and I gave it a 4.25. Okay, that makes sense. You know what? Now that I think about it, it makes sense that Jennifer was on this because she has a very special um, relationship with the actress that played the witch. Yes. I believe. So that's, you know, and of course, she sadly passed away not long ago. But um, and then, of course, there was a, um, a follow up, I believe, that at uh, Telos Publications did. Uh, about the uh, the return to Devil's End or something like that, and and she she actually starred in this little video they did at, at yes. her age. So what a what an amazing thing! So I know that she was very close to that book, and I remember when David Howe was in Chicago last, um, that she he and Jennifer Picker went back and forth on that. It was really wonderful. Um, so yeah, that's a it's a great. I, I like that story personally. It's one of my favorite TV stories from that era, uh, as far as the the sets and the. And in fact, you could still visit the area and it still looks like it did back then, mm -hmm. which is really quite something. It's it's actually not my favorite story, but the book was very good for some reason. Oh, and for a Barry Letts novelization, that's... Yes, that's, that's unusual. <laughs> unusual. <laughs> okay, so uh, there was no book in February. For some reason, February was a bad month, so they didn't do it. So we go straight to March of 82 and we get Doctor Who and the Doomsday Weapon. Uh, with uh, by Malcolm Hulk, and this is the cover by Jeff Cummins, but it has the original illustrations 
inside from Chris Achilleos. I'm going to see if I could. Yeah, here we go. So it has the full page illustrations here Ooh. drawn by Chris Achilleos. So they use the target book prints. Um, so the cover photo uh, appears to be pasted onto purple cloth. I don't know if you can see that, but Ooh. it doesn't quite match the the background and 2,500 copies were printed, which is 500 less than the previous uh, two months. Uh, the reason this book did not get a previous hardcover release in 74. So I'm going to quiz everybody who was listening out there. Remember what I talked about in 1975, the company changed hands. Well, in 74, they did two books. They did hot town invasion and cave monsters. Well, I found out that two more books were planned doomsday weapon and day of the daleks were going to be the next two books with the block logo and the achilleos cover well when the management changed all projects were put on hold and these projects got delayed indefinitely oh. so that's why there were only two books in 74 this is information that came from a new source and it makes sense because if you look at the target books you know you get auton invasion cave monsters doomsday weapon day of the daleks all come in that order so um, that's why we didn't get one sooner. And that's why I would love to have had an original Day of the Daleks hardcover with that original artwork. That would have been a great thing to get. Uh, so that's why this one got delayed until 1982. And it's really quite interesting. So that's uh, they tabled everything. Target books apparently were not affected by the management change because that was a different division of the company. That was the WHLN division of Wyndham. So, and I kind of uh, can relate to that because uh, I know one thing that you and I have in common, Tony, is we both worked for publishing houses. Yes. At one point. And so I remember, um, and now can I look back on it, I can actually figure this out. When our company was being sold and we were told, okay, we're putting projects on hold, no travel, no overtime, no, no expenses at this point, just trying to hold on to the things and then we'll let you know what to do later. And we were like, oh, okay. You know, we didn't know anything was going on. And then a week later we were all called into a room and most of us were laid off. <laughs> so Ooh. it was, oh, that's why. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that thing that, that happens, you know, and I'm sure, uh, you know, that in, in the publishing world, it's, it's just one of those things. Um, so, the, this book, by the way, was not included in USA um, distribution. It probably sold out. Um, and we know, by the way, that um, that this is one of the best drawings of Roger Delgado I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. You know, Jeff Cummins did a really nice job. Um, and this book can be found in uh, any condition for about $300. But however, if you're interested in a brand new copy, DoctorWhoStore.com has a copy on the website for $325. Ooh. Well, there you go. Um, so what did the club think of Doomsday Weapon? Uh, we were very impressed with Doomsday Weapon, as a matter of fact. Uh, that was episode 57. Mm. And JM, JM, JM. I'm looking at my notes and trying to remember who JM is. Oh, my God. Who the hell is JM? 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 Well, I'll figure it out. We'll figure it out later. <laughs> whoever, whoever it was, they gave it a 4.75. Okay. Allison gave it a four. Wow. That's a high score. In fact, she still remembers the name of that book to this day. Wow. So that and Colony in Space, I think, are probably her favorite uh, target novelizations to date uh dalton gave it a 4.5 and i cheated gave it a 4.75 okay because there was something that i didn't like about it and mm. i can't remember what it was but it had to have been something very very small jason miller that's who JM jason is. miller yeah of course <laughs> of course i love jason miller great guy. yeah yeah, yeah, I think that was the first time he was on the podcast, too. Okay, yeah. And uh, just for the listeners, Jason Miller hosts Doctor Who Literature. He's reviewing target books in publication order. So a little bit of a different, you know, different uh, potato, potato, you know, story order, publication order, whatever floats your fancy here. Uh, we've got both in, in oh, under the same network, too, which is even which is even better. But uh, yeah, actually, you know, I actually preferred the book over the TV story myself because I, I i pictured the alien in the uh in the in the glowing box a little bit differently than the puppet oh, they used on tv yes <laughs> and i we know all did. <laughs> and john pertwee himself talked about how awful those machines were with the claw because mm. there was a guy inside there working it 
And that guy was like, man, this thing's heavy. And they got hot. <laughs> and it's like, so it's, it's like all the stuff that, um, you know, when I talked with Peter Purvis about, you know, the fact that he said those Daleks were terrible because we have like eight feet of studio space. They take up three. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I guess when you look at it from our side, it looks like you've got this big place to work, but we know it's just, you know, two feet from the camera. And I, I, I learned that firsthand when I was on the Bozo show in 1975 and <laughs> it's like four feet of tile and then camera. Right. <laughs> wow. Okay. Makes sense to me. So there you go. So the doomsday weapon uh, next in April, uh, we get, and I do not have this one in my collection, so I have to use a target here, but this is Doctor Who and Warrior's Gate, which um, is the first book not to use the the. <laughs> it has the and, but not the the. <laughs> and Warrior's Gate. So, um, and recently at Facebook, somebody said, uh, what's this book about in simple terms? I said, well, it's about a gate and there's some warriors in it. Yes. <laughs> That's Professor, impossible here's my, to do. Here's, here's, here's my book report. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the book, of course, is by John Lidecker, not his real name, and um, the cover by the great Andrew Skilleter. I think it's one of the one of the best paintings um, that, you know, as far as that goes, that is a really nice piece of artwork. Um, the, the book does feature a blue spine, both on the hardcover and the paperback. Uh, very difficult to find in hardcover since I don't have a copy and I've been searching for one for 30 years. Uh, print numbers were not available, but we can guess that they were about 2,500 since they probably didn't veer off in the previous year. This book was obviously not included in USA distribution. Otherwise, I probably would have had one. Um, and we know that John Lidecker is a pseudonym for Stephen Gallagher. Mm -hmm. And the book itself, and you may have reported this on your podcast as well, but I'll go ahead and say the book was delayed for a few months because it was reported that Gallagher's first submission was terrible and was turned down. And so he had to do it again. And um, the Target book was extremely overprinted. 50,000 copies were done. Mm -hmm. So in a marketing move, they got really, really... Uh, uh, ingenious here. They actually uh, used in what's called the Doctor Who gift set. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen it. <laughs> so uh, it was easy to take overstocked books, make a, the, the slip cover easy to make, you know, just flat print and put it together. And inside this set is Warrior's Gate, as well as Keeper of Chalk and Full Circle and Visitation. Now, this is the set I bought when it first came out. People are putting out there that, oh, the four books that were included were this, this, and this. And I said, wait, those probably change depending on stock. Mm -hmm. So when they put these together, and by the way, these were not shrink-wrapped. They were just in the, in the binder. Uh, the later ones were shrink-wrapped. But these had, uh, I've, I've had people tell me, no, no, I've got these four books. No, I've got these four books. Well, that makes sense because they just kind of used up. Okay, we ran out of Warriors Gate. Get me uh, Sunmakers. We'll get wow. to throw that in there. You know, just stuff like that. You know, bring me. You know, Curse of Peladon. We'll throw that in there. You know, and that's what they they did. Of course, Jeff Cummins drew this artwork here on the Five Doctors, which uh, which they used for the program guides. So pretty pretty cool artwork there. So there we go. Um, and uh, by the way, Nissa. Uh, sorry, excuse me, wrong, wrong, uh, wrong script. Here we go. Uh, the gift set does. My gift set doesn't have it in the first one, but it has it in the second one. So they change books according to the stock. Uh, how was? I know Warriors Gate was not long ago for you. Not I, long ago at all. It was episode oh. one twenty five. Um, we had, and I'm doing it again. Oh, Jennifer Picker again. Yes, uh, Jennifer Picker was on. She gave it a three point nine. Dalton gave it a four. Allison gave it a 3.5. So she was like books all throughout this. I gave it another 4.75. I don't know what it is that keeps me from giving fives. But yeah, if we're, if we're looking at Doctor Who and the Daleks by David Whitaker as a five. That's, that's your a, standard. Yeah, that's a pretty difficult pinnacle. So to, uh, no pun intended no. to try to achieve. <laughs> Sorry, but first, uh, first Pinnacle did not publish Doctor and the Daleks, so we no, no, <laughs> they did. Thank goodness, nor they didn't. Warriors Gate. Nope, sadly, uh, nope, they didn't do that either. <laughs> yes, and a new version of Warriors Gate has just been put out on yes. audio, 
and I haven't listened to it yet, but if 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 that's the expanded script and it's supposed to be better than the book, that's hard to believe. That would probably get a five from me. Yeah, I'll have to check it out, and we'll we'll report back, of course, uh, to our listeners about that. Um, but yeah, it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting read. I did read this one when I was younger. Uh, this hap, I believe, this is a first edition Target book. Yes, it is. This is the first edition. So um, not much different. The the second edition has a different Target logo in the corner, I believe, but that's, um, you know, not much there. As far as the hardback, it's exactly the same. It has the same back cover as the front cover. Uh, good luck finding one though, because uh, I am i couldn't even put a price on it since I've not seen one. And I've asked around and nobody, you know, very few collectors have a copy of Warrior's Gate. And if they do have one, it's an ex-library copy. So that's, uh, you know, that's just the, the, the breaks for that. Uh, and of course, I only have one complete year now, and that's 1981. I finally got all the books for that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and I'm almost done with 1988. I've got like one more left to find for that one, and I'll be done with the 88 year. But there was only five books. So mm. that's, uh, you know, spoiler alert, guys, we get it gets worse as we go forward. <laughs> right. So we go now to uh, let's see, we were just in uh in April. April, we're in May now. May now, May of 1982, we get Doctor Who and the Keeper of Trocken by Terence Dix, with another great cover by Andrew Skilleter, with a wonderful drawing of Sarah Sutton on the front cover. Um, Three thousand copies were done, but not included in the USA distribution. This is also one of the few times that hardcovers were printed in story order, as the previous story was Warrior's Gate. So mm -hmm. that doesn't happen very often, except for Auton Invasion and Cave Monsters were the last ones and the key to time books, mostly. Mm -hmm. If you skip Pirate Planet, they're in order. Um, for some reason, this is interesting. Between the hardcover and the Target book, and I'm going to hold this up so my guests can see that, they use different fonts for the title and author. Oh, that's an odd odd font i've never i've never seen that font on the yeah, doctor book before. and i believe paul smith's book identifies the font but i found that to be information that we probably don't need <laughs> so um <laughs> but it was interesting to see the difference between the two um and for some reason yeah it's just weird a copy and by the way a copy of the 1984 target book printing is also included in the second doctor who gift set another plug for that and so that's the keeper of chalk and is right above orier's gate so there we go um interesting too about the cover is that it's the only cover to feature nissa mm -hmm. because the story pretty much rotates around her this is her story and um and the melker of course so um also uh interesting about the story is that it, it features jeffrey beavers as the master who happens to be um, married to Carolyn John, whose daughter, Daisy Ashford, now plays Liz Shaw for Big Finish. Isn't that wild? Yeah, it really <laughs> when, is. When Doctor Who stars have children who become Doctor Who stars. <laughs> and we're still, uh, we're still keeping our fingers crossed to getting Daisy on the program. She has been extremely busy with work. She apologized in an email the other day saying, I will get to you soon. I promise we're just, I'm just working. I said, no, 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 work is important. Mm -hmm. You know, this is fun. You know, we do this when, when you can. Um, she didn't, uh, and the other reason too, that it featured her is she didn't ask for a lot of money for her likeness. Ooh. It was reported that she was not as, uh, she was like, Oh, I'll, I'll take, uh, and they're like, really? Okay. Sign here. <laughs> okay, good. Here's your money. We got your, we got your image. So um, she will not appear of course on any uh, future books until the spine, uh, the blue spine edition of Legopolis features her on it. Okay. Uh, this, this book is actually pretty hard to find. You can pay up to $400 or more. And this particular copy is an ex library copy. It's got a big uh, space in the front where the uh, um, pocket was ripped off. And it's got, let's see, I can't even read it, but it's got a library stamp on the cover here, but it's still in nice shape. It's not too bad. Um, so what was the, and this is also a recent one for you. So how was the Keeper of Trocket? Right, episode 126. So for us, obviously, it was right after Warriors Gate as well. Uh, we were not impressed with this one. Hmm. In fact, uh, Allison and Dalton gave it range scores, which they only do when they really don't like something. Oh. Allison gave it between a 1.25 and a 1.5. 
which wow. is her normal. Dalton yeah. gave it a 2.5 to a 3, which is fairly low for him. And I gave it a 2. There's just something about that book. Terrence Dix was not all that inspired by it for some reason. Mm. And there are only a few little additions to it to make it any more special than it was on screen. So, yeah, we were... We were not amused, shall we say. Yeah. Uh, I get it. Sometimes it doesn't happen. It's a book I didn't happen to read when I was younger. So it's it's uh, maybe I do- dodged a bullet there. So, But I did enjoy the TV story. That was a lot of surprises in that that I did not expect, especially the master and all that. And, of course, Anthony Ainley coming out at the end. And I'm going, and, of course, when I first saw that regen- that little thing they he did at the end, and I'm going, Oh, they're trying to bring back a Roger Delgado look. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and of course, as a kid, I didn't know that Roger Delgado had died in a accident uh, after Frontier in Space. Uh, you know, we weren't getting Doctor Who magazine. So I had no idea that he wasn't available uh, for anything. I'm like, pretty, pretty sure. But Anthony Ainley uh, still uh, and Anthony Ainley, one of the nicest guys I've ever met, uh, met him in 1985. He was wonderful to the fans. Uh, he even... Uh, uh, did some he did a little bit of uh, of, of role play uh, someone had brought him a, a model TARDIS and he got the microphone and said at last doctor I've cut you down to size <laughs> it was <laughs> it the place went wild he was really quite something uh, but I actually hear that he was quite the introvert in in real life and actually when when his death was reported he was by himself mm. so he, he wasn't much of a, a social person but uh, one of one of the best at masters, in my opinion, uh, for for that era. Uh, and of course, uh, it looks like they took uh, a summer vacation because there were no books in June. So we go to July of 1982, which uh, just in time for SweatCon. And uh, we get Doctor Who and the Leisure Leisure Hive by David Fisher with a cover by Andrew Skilleter. Uh, no print run information is available, so we're going to guess somewhere around 2,500 to 3,000 were printed. None of these were sent to the United States. Um, this is, by the way, the uh, this hardcover is the first Doctor Who hardcover to say, uh, to not say, a children's book by W.H. Allen. Since W.H. Allen uh, took over publishing, all the Doctor Who novels had a children's book, or it was filed under children. Now it's filed under science fiction. So that was a big change. Uh, The Target book, actually, the first edition Target book, which I don't have, has a notable mistake on the title page that says it is a star book (laughs) and not a Target book. The second edition corrects that. So there you go. The book also mysteriously has no contents page. At first, I thought it was left off, but it goes right from copyright to the prologue, which is interesting. Uh, the cover, by the way, is available from Andrew Skilleter at andrewskilleter.com. He is a listener, the great Andrew Skilleter, as I like to say. He is indeed. Um, and we do that. Prints are available. This book can command a very high price. This book is in absolute horrible condition. Uh, it is, uh, it's hard to see on the screen, but it is completely wrapped in plastic and taped. Oh. Taped down. So when I thought I could remove it, I said, that's going to be some major surgery. So one day when I get the steamer out, I might try it. But if it starts to go bad, I'm going to leave it the way it is. Uh, the thing is, they actually laminated over the price tag on the bottom. <laughs> 1350 Lyle Stewart, which is interesting. No, no, excuse me. 13. Yeah, this is 1350, but not Lyle Stewart's name tag. Oh. They laminated right over it. Um, the library is from, can I read that? Nope. Can't read it. So, but yeah, so not. save your hate mail because you won't be able to find them. Exactly. <laughs> 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 so there you go. Um, there is also a rumor that the first edition target was included in the target book set, but mine does not include this book. So like I said before, they use different books depending on stock. Um, some sources listed. So, of course, the contents of these, like I said, the contents of the gift sets change with inventory. So there you go. Um, Leisure Hive was not one of my favorite stories, and I know it wasn't one of Tom Baker's favorite stories either. So uh, how did the Target book like this one? 
We loved that one. That was episode 121, and we had uh, Jennifer Picker back on. It's a Jennifer she Picker gave, show. <laughs> yep. We gave it a three. She gave it a 3.4 to 3.5. Allison gave it a three. So, again, that, okay. that was a winner for Allison. Belton gave it a 3.5, and I gave it a four. I would say that that is probably one of David Fisher's best books, if not the best David Fisher books, even though Stones of Blood comes awfully close. Okay. I mean, his version and not the Terrence Dixon. Right. The newer version. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I just know that when I watched the story, there was, um, and Tom Baker did a little bit of commentary on it later in life where he said that he absolutely hated the, he hated the makeup process more in Leisure Hive than he did for Megloss. Right. And uh, just to do that whole thing, but it was not a story I've rewatched. So mm -hmm. that's, that's that, but uh, I'm glad to have a copy of the hardcover though. Cause that was, uh, I did get it for a pretty good price, even though it's pretty beaten up. And um, unfortunately I, and, and I talking about beaten up, I saw somebody was selling a, a copy of an Arthur three child hardcover. It looked like it had been run over by a truck and they wanted $600 for it. Oh, for God's sake. And I was like, you know, I know I haven't seen very many for sale, but I'm not willing to, you know, if it's been in the mud, I'm not touching it. So <laughs> not not going to happen. Um, we go to August and we get a number of firsts in August. So the first the first things first <laughs> is it's Doctor Who and the Visitation by Eric Sayward. And, uh, and but we have no artist to credit because uh, we have a photo cover of Peter Davison. And this is because Peter Davison rejected Every single art idea, including prints, by the way, by Jeff Cummins, David McAllister, and Andrew Skilleter. Now, David McAllister's was the top one that the publishers liked. And you can actually see that cover in a copy of a book called Time Frame by David J. Howe. It's a book I don't have on my shelf. Otherwise, I would show it here. Um, and the, the notion that Davison was hard to draw, I've seen Chris Achilleos draw Peter Davison. It's pretty good. I've seen Andrew Skilleter draw it. It's pretty good. So, But I heard he was extremely picky about how, how he looked. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the time, he was pretty vain. I think today, and even so, he made a comment a few years ago at Chicago TARDIS when he walked into the elevator and he was like, God damn it, there are mirrors everywhere. I can see the back <laughs> of my head. <laughs> and... But, you know, just, you know, I kind of I, I wonder, you're an actor, you know, you're concerned about how you look. And that's uh, that's that's how that goes. Um, no print run information. So we can guess um, that it was about twenty five hundred to three thousand copies and no copies of this book were sent to the United States. So this is Peter Davison's first novel to be published in hardcover and paperback. Uh, now. Going forward, Alistair Pearson will actually do the cover for the Blue Spine edition. And stay tuned, everybody. I've been getting tons of emails. When are you going to talk about the Blue Spines? Mm. <laughs> blue Spines are smiling at me. <laughs> I'm going to do one on Blue Spines this year. I promised everybody. I said I will get them. I've almost got a full set of Blue Spines myself, but I will talk about the Blue Spines uh, and what's so special about them and why they stopped and they get abruptly, they stop abruptly and there's no explanation, but there is an explanation. So there's a little bit of information about them in the Target book by David J. Howe, but um, I will go in depth on those very soon so um by and also this is another first and a last this is the first the last book to include the and the mm -hmm. doctor who and the visitation well that'll be the last time you get that after that it's going to be doctor who dash the story all the way through they don't even bring back the end so warrior's gate didn't have the the this is the and the um so there you go uh, unfortunately um it doesn't apply to Sunmakers at the end of the year because they didn't get the memo. So it's Doctor <laughs> Who and the Sunmakers. So, oh, well, yeah, you can't win them all. Um, the other interesting thing I want to point out to you, the difference between the hardcover, you notice that the hardcover doesn't have the little banner in the corner that the paperback has that says the first television story for Peter Davison. Mm -hmm. So they decided not to do that. But the back cover is exactly the same. Has the same the same blurb. And there we go. Um, expect to pay about $200 for this book. This is a, um, oh, wow. This is a non-library version. <laughs> Lucky me. Ooh. So there you go. Uh, I don't remember when I got it. I've had it a long time. So I, 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 if I have a sticker on the back, it'll. I do not. So I try to put the information on the back so I know when I got it, how much I paid for it, but I don't remember. Um, 
And uh, by the way, this is probably, this is one of the reasons why this podcast was delayed a little while. The Target Book Club has just done this one. Because they're slow. (laughs) Because they're slow. But we're going to get, this is fresh off the press. So how did the Target Book Club, and I did listen to this, so I know the answer, but go ahead, Tony. (laughs) Well, episode 131, which as of this recording is the latest released episode. Yes, current and latest. When this one comes out, it'll not be. Right. Um, (laughs) We had Jim Sangster on for the very first yes, time. Yes, yes, yeah. I enjoyed, I enjoyed him, and it was yeah. it was a great time. And he'll be on again for Earthshock. Oh, so that's right. Yes, yes, that's something yes. we're looking forward to. Uh, but Allison wasn't on for that one. She will be on for Earthshock because I told her she had to be. <laughs> but uh, all three of us, uh, Jim Sangster, myself, and Dalton, all gave it a three point five. We were all well. Here's the thing. It's Eric Sayward's first book. Yes. So there's certain things he does really well, and there are other things that he doesn't do quite as well as he could have. Mm. So it all balances out in the wash. Okay. And as we all know from reading Eric Sayward's later books, he's going to get worse and worse at it as time yeah. goes on. Yeah. But yeah, 3.5 this time. Now, this this story had a unique moniker back when I was a kid in Doctor Who magazine. They had proclaimed the visitation to be the greatest Doctor Who story ever written. <laughs> so we were excited to watch it. And I kind of said, it was pretty good. Yeah, it's a very meh story <laughs> if you're watching it on screen. I was like, I was expecting more, <laughs> you know, because they had really hyped this. John Nathan Turner said, this is our greatest achievement in Doctor Who. Well, hmm, and that was the same year they done Earthshock. So you yes. think that they'd be pumping that one up? They pumped that this really one. Was. Yeah, it was for some reason this was the big one, and that was the one that you know even uh, Channel Eleven in Chicago built it built it up as you know this is going to be a big big night big night. Uh, they did a pledge break on this one, so oh, that's they so they got a lot of money off of it. But I was like, no, this is not Earthshock's a better story than than this one, um, better than Four to Doomsday. I will say that, um, but uh, yeah, definitely not the not the uh, not the top story that they were going for. Um, but anyway, uh, if you'd like to find uh, a copy of this, I was looking on uh, uh, Doctor Who store. They had one this morning, but it's gone now, so I'm not going to tell you what it went for. Uh, but you could probably find this if you look on uh, eBay. I've seen a few of these floating around, and uh, don't be you know don't give up if you're st- if you're like I need visitation to complete my collection. If you've got if you've gotten that far, congratulations because I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> and I've still got I've got people arguing with me about whether Second Prince ad- exist. Oh. So it's it's um, we found out that uh, Revenge of the Cybermen does exist. Somebody sent me a photo. So oh. there we go. It does. It did get a reprint in seventy seven. So did Genesis of the Daleks. Uh, and uh, but we you know we're still you know they're still fighting about Space War version three. So I don't know. I don't think it got. I don't think it happened. Only one book got a third printing, and it's Loch Ness Monster. And I don't know why. But I know it exists because I have it on my shelf. So that's it, it's like I said, it's it's like high school. Everybody's arguing back and forth about stuff. And I'm like, guys, come on. <laughs> Settle. OK, we go to October. Um, we get Doctor Who. Sorry, excuse me. September. I jumped over to October. September. We get Doctor Who full circle. Mm-hmm. No and or the, by the way. Doctor Who and the Full Circle. Nope, nope. Andrew Smith uh, wrote the book, and Andrew Skilleter did the uh, artwork, the uh, the marsh creature on the front, um, which looks better than the rubber suits that you see on TV. 2,500 copies were printed. None of these copies landed on our shores here. Andrew, by the way, still owns the original painting to this, so all the prints can be made from the original, and you can get that at andrewskilleter.com. Uh, this book got a price increase to £5.25 which would be 17 pounds today or 21 us dollars little tiny book 21 dollars of course this book today will command much more as this book is very hard to find um this particular copy is a library copy although it's a not bad in fact the binding is still tight so i don't think it got a lot of circulation but it doesn't look like it's well read so it's in pretty good shape DoctorWhoStore.com has a new copy for $450. So that's the price I'm putting on it. Uh, So get it while you can. I think he's got one copy. So how was full circle for you, Tony? Well, that was episode 123. And we loved that book, though I notice our scores don't reflect it. Um, Okay. Dalton gave it a four. 
Allison gave it a three. So again, that's a sign of love on her part. And I gave it a four. Okay. And I remember loving that book. And I don't know, I cannot remember now why hmm. I scored it lower, as low as I did, because, yeah, that should probably come in a bit higher. I'd probably say 4.5 more like, <laughs> because the book of that story is amazing. That's great to hear. I mean, I, I actually didn't mind the TV story as it was the first of the eSpace uh, adventures and uh, that Alzarius has the exact same coordinates as Gallifrey. Mm -hmm. So that's, that was interesting too. So very, I, I thought it was a very interesting um, story. Uh, but uh, again, you know, the hardcover book, not too easy to find. I have not seen very many of these and I've had this one for quite a few years. Now we can go to October. Um, we get Doctor Who Legopolis by Christopher H. Bidmead with a cover by Andrew Skilleter. And the cover, by the way, kind of reminded me a little bit back to the Doomsday Weapon, those, those masters side by side. And they don't have anything to do with each other, but I thought what an amazing thing to have in the same year. Um, 2,500 copies were done, but not included in U.S. distribution. This is a mint copy from 1986, and I'm really glad to have it. Um, so the fact that uh, it had fewer copies run than full circle, so it might not have sold. The other thing too, is that this book, like some of the previous, like the previous book, Leisure Hive, no contents page goes straight from the copyright page to the story. So we weren't sure why those were left out. Now I've double checked. It's not ripped out. All the sources say it has no contents page. So there you go. Uh, one of the best covers of Anthony Ainley. And again, Anthony Ainley did not ask for a lot for his likeness. In fact, he loved the portrait. And he has, uh, I believe, the last time I checked, uh, according to Andrew Skilleter, he actually gave an original painting to Anthony Ainley. We don't know what happened to it after that. So it's it went to his heirs or wherever auction or whatever. I don't know if he had any heirs. I have no idea. Um, but the 1983 Target edition of this book was included in the fourth Doctor Who gift set that I don't have. That's a hard one to find. Uh, but again, all these they they printed almost 50,000 copies of these Target books in, in 82. Maybe that's why they only did eight stories. Uh, they didn't sell very well. And they, they had a bunch of books. And of course, um, they didn't send any of the hardcovers to the United States, which means they probably sold out of the hardcovers, but did not... Um, you know, have enough to, to, to distribute. Uh, according to a few people I talked to, they did not ever see this book in a U.S. bookstore. Um, I have seen a couple for sale, uh, Abe Books or eBay. Uh, you can pay about 150 on up for this book. It's not that sought after as far as that goes. So again, this is another recent story for the Target Book Club. And what do you guys think of Legopolis? This would be episode 127. We had J.G. McCory, who oh, is yes, the yes. co-host of Talking Who to You, which is now ended. And he's right. the co-host of the new podcast, Talking Trek to You. Ah. I believe this is his favorite book, which is why he requested to be on the show for it. We also had him on for Castro Valva. He gave this a five. Okay. Dalton gave it a 3.5. Allison gave it a three, surprising us all again. And I surprised myself by giving it a 4.75 because this book is almost flawless. There's almost, uh, it's almost perfect. It's a really, really great book. And it is so, so much better than the televised version, which I have to admit kind of bores me a bit, even though it's Tom Baker's last story. Last story. Yeah. I still, I still watched it uh, with eyes glued because I was going to, I was wondering, how is this going to end? You know, how is this going to go? And, and it was, it was really, I thought the idea was good. The execution, not so much. And I can tell Tom Baker was probably phoning it in a bit yes. um, because it was his last story. And after they finished wrapping up filming, the first thing he did is got his hair cut off mm -hmm. so that nobody would recognize him. And which is kind of a shame because he has, he's full of regret now of not doing five doctors, not doing the, 
you know, all these other projects. And now he says, now I'm old and I can't do anything. Uh, except, so. except he's been recording for big finish all yes. this time. And I was, yes, absolutely. I was going to mention, he's still doing Tom Baker is still doing the fourth doctor for big finish and will keep doing it as long as he is able. Sadly though, his, um, his autograph store is completely closed. Uh, he is no longer signing autographs. Uh, and that has to do with his health. Um, they said that he couldn't, he was having trouble holding a pen steady. So, uh, at this point, uh, you know, I'm glad to have a few Tom Baker autographs, but I don't think they're going to be coming anytime soon mm. as I believe he's what 91. I, Let's I'm, see. I'm throwing 1931, I believe. Yeah. So 92. Yeah. 92. Well, we've never had a Doctor Who actor playing Doctor Who reach that age. So, he, you know, Tom, I met Tom back in 84 and he was one of the nicest people. Uh, he also gave it to one of our news anchors here in Chicago. I may have, I think I've shared the story before, but it's worth sharing again. Um, he goes into CBS, I believe it was CBS, CBS Studios. And some of the people saw him walk in and got really excited, but the guy interviewing him had never heard of him. Oh, no. So, so Tom was like, so he's like, so the guy asked him, so uh, why do you think you're so important? And why are you, the, you know, and Tom's like, well, people like you who invent, I mean, write the news. <laughs> <laughs> he just nailed him. And and then, of course, he just slunked back in his chair and then he kind of let the interview like like left the interview or high and dry. And I wish I could find I, I used to have a tape of that. and I don't have it any longer, but I, I keep looking for YouTube copies of that. It's just a great interview. Um so that's Legopolis. And of course, uh, the final book is in November. They took December off. Mm. So there are no books in December. Uh, but we go to an interesting twist here. We're going to Doctor Who and the Sunmakers. <laughs> <laughs> and with a, with a great picture of Henry Wolf on the front cover. Boy, he was uh, quite an actor. I mean, I just read the scenes where he's there. He's playing with the hair and... <laughs> <laughs> you know, being full into this character and uh, just just uh that and i've some i sometimes use that clip when i introduce the most outrageous offer you know from your private purse <laughs> you spoke <laughs> i i love that um anyway this book of course is by terrence dix um and it's uh Cover by Andrew Skilleter, of course, great stuff here. So, the, of course, this book might have been delayed in publication because they didn't get the uh, memo about the end. The it's like, darn it, man, we put end on there. Oh, man, uh, no print run information was available, so we can guess it was either 2,500 to 3,000. I'm going to guess it's the lower amount since um, the books. Um, you know, weren't doing this book didn't do very well at all because this book did get sent to the United States. Uh, and we got it turns out we got the books that they couldn't sell so oh. that's that's um you know a couple of 82 prints and i know we priced the 82 prints a little bit higher because they were the older ones uh but we didn't know that they were the excess stock so it was quite something um this was the final uh this was the final target book that had the end the yes on the cover so there we go um it is also now the final hardcover to do that because in 83 there was no more and the so and and the got laid off from uh wph allen <laughs> and uh, they had to go find titles elsewhere to get in there um this is um also by the way interesting note that it's the only tom baker story not to use the same logo on the book that covered the story Ooh. most of the uh early uh, Tom Baker stories were done during the Lodge years, the Lodge logo. Uh, Logopolis, of course, uses the Sutton logo, uh, but they had exclusively turned over to the Sutton logo for all publications. So this was the first Tom Baker story not to have that logo. It was just somebody that pointed that out to me. Um, this book uh, is uh, basically, they said the Lodge logo was used when some makers aired, which is true. It was one of the final stories up to Invasion of Time and then there was another season and then another season. And then we get the new logo. Uh, this book is not very hard to find. You can find it about $150 in non-library or library condition. This is a non-library condition, still pretty tight. Um, and uh, it has uh, basically, I think it still has the scratched off uh, price tag on the back. So there we go. Five pound 25 on this one. So how was the Sunmakers for you guys? That was episode 99. 
And Jenny Ingersoll was on for that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she gave it a five because she couldn't imagine a Target book getting better than that one. Okay. But then she doesn't read as many as we do. As we do, right? <laughs> but we also liked it because Dalton gave it a four and I gave it a four. It is Terrence Sticks having, I wouldn't say a last hurrah because some of his later books are okay. Mm-hmm. But it really is an amazing book. Yeah. And I think it's because he actually cares about the story and is willing to do something for it. Because as we've said before, it's a Robert Holmes script and Terrence Dix takes very good care of Robert Holmes scripts. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I, I still love the little nuance in the story, like all the all the uh, numbers and things that have to do with uh, tax pages or tax codes mm-hmm. in England. And the whole story is economic warfare which at the time the economy in england was not doing very well so it was it was very uh it's it's almost like uh if you listen to the song tax man by george harrison and the beatles did it he mm. actually names two prime ministers in that song yeah you know, mr yeah. mr wilson mr mr heath <laughs> you know because uh, george got inspired because he got his tax bill and realized that the luxury tax kicked in <laughs> and he's like that's taking all my money <laughs> it's like <laughs> tax it, man great great song other interesting bit of trivia about this particular yeah. book is the scene where um Haig is thrown over the side of the building and everybody yeah. cheers Terrence stick specifically hated that scene oh and thought that it was a little too a little too much for a children's program for someone to be murdered and then to have people cheer about it. So in the novelization, he has him thrown over the side, but then the people who throw him over the side look over the side and are feeling bad about it because they realize what they've done just at the last moment. So it's one of the few times that Terrence Dix changes anything to fit his conception of what Doctor Who should be as opposed to basically rattling off the script exactly as it was on screen. I still think that is one of one of the best scenes because that actor was over the top for the entire production. And yeah. then he was over the top at the end. Like, put me down. How <laughs> dare you hand me like this? What are you doing? <laughs> and it was it was really wonderful. And I oh, thought yeah. what a what a great performance. And he did a great job. And his chemistry with Henry Wolf doing that was was it was just amazing. Also, another uh, another quick trivia thing too that uh blake seven actor uh michael keating was um oh yes was in there uh, villa. villa in blake seven he was also in doctor who and so he meets the uh and i don't know if he was if he was in uh, i claudius then he meets the trifecta according to john hodgman so mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> by, the, by the way that's the ipodius podcast uh and you should if you're if you're a fan of if you don't ever want to watch i claudius don't just get the podcast and they do yes. <laughs> so it's it's you know of course brian blessed of course is in it and of course i'm in it because he's loud and all that uh even colin <laughs> baker said that there wasn't enough room for him and brian blessed in the same room when they were acting together (laughs) but uh that takes care of the 1982 hardcover books now nine books it went by a lot quicker so um i figured out if you want to own a set of 1982 books good luck because i don't um (laughs) the warrior's gate very hard to find but i made an estimate based on uh actual prices and my guesses and you could pay probably about 3575 dollars for that year um which is more expensive than last year by the way uh i i'm missing just the one but uh, my advice to all collectors is if you find a, you know an auction uh make an offer make it reasonable don't be crazy you know people are you know they're trying to get something for it and if you go too low they're just going to ignore you um mm-hmm. always negotiate when possible i usually try when i make an offer i'll usually say hi i host the doctor of collectors podcast here's my research here's where i think it should be and i'm going to meet you here nine times out of ten they get accepted because they read my argument. A lot of times they go, nope, <laughs> sorry, don't care. <laughs> and that that's fine. And then that way I, I you know, it, it's like the, uh, the Kenny Rogers song, no when to walk away. You know, that's <laughs> definitely it. Cause I've walked away from uh, uh, auctions before. It's like, nope, sorry, too rich for me. 
Um, you, you can find these books at Abe's Used Books at abebooks.com, but uh, they are going to be priced a little higher. Uh, eBay, if you set your search engine to Doctor Who in quotes and then put WH Allen or Wingate after that and use it as a save search, you'll get a daily email update on those books that are listed brand new. And I get those every day for research and also what I'm looking for. Uh, beware of price gouging online. Uh, watch the Facebook groups too. Every once in a while in the Target book uh, group or the Doctor Who collecting groups, uh, you can find some very reliable sellers uh, such as Dale Santos and uh, David Russell, all great folks. Uh, David Russell's from Scotland, Dale's from California. Uh, you can also find uh, a lot of hardcover books at DoctorWhoStore.com. Gene bought another collection the other day. Uh, which is interesting because his wife told him to stop buying collections. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. He doesn't listen to this podcast, but anyway, uh, it's like, he, it's, I'm like, Oh, but I always get first grab at those, by the way, he, he'll send me a message with a picture. It's like, Hey, here's what I got. You know? And I'm like, I got all those. He's like, okay, just, you know, you're the, first. I, he's got a list of people and I'm at the top of that list. So I, I guess, you know, I go back a long way with him. Um, and but sometimes, by the way, Who North America also bought a collection recently, and they had a bunch of hardcovers, including a book that was signed by John Nathan Turner. Oh, so not too bad. And I actually own a book now that was in John Nathan Turner's private library. I have a letter that accompanied it that says that he owned this a copy of the Sea Devils in hardcover that came with a letter. It said this was in John Nathan Turner's private library. It was willed to his partner. And it was when his partner died, it was willed to me. Ooh. Like I've got the legal paperwork that shows that this was on his shelf when he was at the BBC. Ooh. So that's pretty cool. Um, my special thanks, of course, is to my wonderful guest and my good friend, Tony Witt, the host and producer of the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, which you can find on SoundCloud and most podcast providers. So, Tony, what's coming up next for the podcast? We are going to be releasing... Black Orchid next, oh, and yes. we had Jason Miller on that one. It ended up being a very interesting discussion because that book is surprisingly very interesting. Uh -huh. And then we will have all four of us, Jim Sangster, myself, Dalton, and Allison on Earthshock quite soon. And here's the fun part. Mm. Allison and Dalton don't know what happens to Adric. Oh, <laughs> well, Dalton gonna... has had it ruined for him that the Cybermen are in it. Okay. Well, but we're apart not from that, here. <laughs> yes, yes, they no. don't know what happens. Oh, dear. And of course, uh, just a, a note about Black Orchid that's a hardcover that comes out next year. It is one of the most pricey hardcovers to find. Well, about uh, that. 500 or more for that cover because it's a beautiful cover. Also, one of my favorite stories because of that cricket match. <laughs> that is one of the best things to watch oh uh, we I, have things to say about the cricket match <laughs> i'm sure but if you watch that cricket match and then go back to all creatures rate and small and watch that cricket match you'll find a lot of similarities because they were both produced by john nathan turner ah uh, is that why yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. I've, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, well, I just enjoy cricket. That's just a, a wonderful, a wonderful sport. Um, anyway, um, our future uh, episodes will, of course, continue our, our classic hardcover adventure for 1983, but we got to give the Target Book Club a little chance to catch up. So you'll catch that episode probably closer to Chicago TARDIS time in November. Um, and we will look at those hardcovers, which, by the way, of a lot of the 83 ones were included in the USA distribution plan. Uh, follow us on Instagram at Doctor Who Collectors to see full cover art of all the books we talked about today. Uh, if you'd like to watch this episode, you can find it on Patreon, and that's uh, uh, with a $15 or above subscription. You can watch the video here. You can see myself and Tony's beautiful daughter up there on the screen. Wonderful yes, stuff. Yes, thank you. And if you happen to have any photos or proof of life of any second editions that we have no idea exist, please send those to Dr. Who Collectors Podcast at gmail.com with the hardcover photo in the subject line so it doesn't go to my spam box. Um, and uh, in fact, if you have any questions at all or you want to see something here that we haven't talked about, or if you have additional information, or that I'm a dirty liar and I've got better information, go for it. This is America. We can do that here. Um, and again, thanks for being here, Tony. Yes, thank you for having me. Matt, stay tuned for the most outrageous offer. 
the vervoids are probably the best dirty joke in Doctor Who. They're hermaphroditic plants. A lot of plants are. So there you but go. Yeah. That's, it's based on science. No, well, they'll ship anything. There are probably 11 and handle shippers out there. You just have to drill a hole where his mouth is and you're all set. You know yeah. he needs the room. I've seen it in pictures. I'm not saying you're not a fan. I'm saying you don't know what the f*** you're talking about. Doctor Who gives a f- A drunken Doctor Who podcast for the end times. You are invited on an adventure across all of time and space, in a completely random order. It's the Police Box in the Junkyard podcast. Jump in the TARDIS with your hosts, Eric Colbranson, Asad Khashki, and Matthew Kressel. Explore Doctor Who TV stories, audio adventures, and books, both novels and non-fiction. The Police Box in the Junkyard podcast. It's the entire who universe On Shuffle. The Police Box in the Junkyard podcast is a member of the Direction Point Network and is available about once a month wherever you find your podcasts. You are listening to the Doctor Who Collectors podcast. Keep collecting. Hi, I'm Rupert Booth. I am known as Paul Ferry. And my name is Barry Williams. Together, we host Time Ram. Time Ram's a cruel mistress. It's a random number generator. That also. We roll a number from 1 to 30, and that's our doctor. Then 1 to 300 for the story, and then we ram them together. Even if it doesn't make sense. Cruel, I tell you. Time round. Putting the wrong doctors in the wrong stories, so you don't have to. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Hello fellow time travelers and welcome to the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, the only podcast to discuss, in story order, all the Doctor Who novelizations. My name is Tony Whit, and every two weeks or so I'm joined by a two to three person discussion panel, including our so-called expert who's been a Who fan since 1979, that would be me. We also get the views of intermediate, casual, and novice fans who either have never seen the show or who have never read these books until these podcasts, including Dalton Hughes and Alison Fitzsafried. You can find us on iTunes, Stitchers, or wherever you find good podcasts, or even ones like ours. You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast on the Direction Point Podcast Network. Keep collecting! In all my travelings throughout the universe, I have battled against evil, against power-mad conspirators. I should have stayed here. The oldest civilization, decadent, degenerate, and rotten to the core. Power-mad conspirators, Daleks, Sontarans, Cybermen. They're still in the nursery compared to us. Ten million years of absolute power. That's what it takes to be really corrupt. And now it's time for the most outrageous offer. The most outrageous offer is a Doctor Who item, any Doctor Who item or Doctor Who related item that is priced way above where it should be and way above where you can actually get it for a lot less. And I I researched these pretty carefully. I look around at many different places. Sometimes I don't have to look very far to find it um, an item a lot less. And then sometimes uh, if I have a chance before I record, I'll buy the darn thing at the lower price just to say I can get it. And oftentimes when I, I've stopped writing to sellers because they don't answer back and they don't do anything. So there's no point in wasting my energy there. Uh, Today, we have a book here published by Big Finish Productions in 2004. They didn't do a lot of books, but uh, this was called Doctor Who Short Trips Monsters. And it's by uh, Ian Farrington, published by Big Finish. And uh, this seller is actually from Washington State, lower key, sorry, low key books from Sumas, Washington, United States, uh, online seller since 2018 with a five-star seller rating. This was on abooks, abooks.com. And uh, it says here that the hardcover is in good condition. And of course, there's no jacket. It's a laminated cover, so there wouldn't need to be one. Um, Anyway, they're asking uh, free shipping within the United States, but they're asking for $1,463.62. Now, the problem I have here, of course, anytime I see 62 cents on the end of a price, that's not a price that was figured out logically because I would have said, okay, 1463, period. 
you know, $1,000. There you go. I don't like messing with change and there's no tax. So there's nothing to really do there. Um, but I also checked to see, does it translate into British pounds? Nope. When I did that, it still left change. So I'm not sure why they did that. Um, not totally convinced that that's a good price because I did find it in two other places that we all know and love. Um, first of all, I went to amazon.com. I usually try to see, is it still out there? Yes. Um, there are, um, used copies available from, uh, $47 and 15 cents, but there's a new copy here for 59 99, which seems a little bit more reasonable given the age of the book. And this is a new copy. Uh, this is a good condition copy for 1200 and some change. I found several on eBay with the price of $49. Um, so that's also, it says spine and pages is extremely tight. Um, whoever I bought it, put it in a protective bag. Oh, bags unlimited would love you. Um, always put your collectible books into a protective acid free environment. Keep them from, you know, that keeps them new, keeps them in good shape. I mean, yeah, if you want to read it, go ahead, but you know, put it back in the, uh, put it back in the bag when you're done. So, um, I declare this outrageous. Uh, let me go back to that original listing here. And of course these listings will be on our website so you can see what I'm talking about. I will post the links as well. Sometimes the links go dead because somebody finds out about it. They write to the place and they take it down, but, uh, $1,463 and 62 cents. And the, the new, I'm going to go with the new price here. So let me plug that in here. 1463, 62, and then 59 99. Let's say that's a savings of $1,403.63 just to do the quick math. But, um, I would not buy it from the seller on eight books. Um, I don't, I don't know if this person has other doctor who items. I didn't go back to check. Uh, this was sent to me anonymously. So I checked it out. The link still worked and I did some research on it. Anyway, big finish. I have a bunch of big finish books in my collection. A lot of Bernie Summerfield and some other, um, hard covers that they did. So they're definitely collectible. I would say that they, cause they, they stopped doing books. Uh, altogether and and CDs are even few and far between some of the early uh, CD recordings from Big Finish highly collectible. So there you go. That's the most outrageous offer. And that wraps up this episode of the Doctor Who Collectors podcast. I want to thank my good friend and guest, Mr. Tony Witt, for um, giving us the story insights on these wonderful hardcover books. And if you'd like to learn more about the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, you can just Google them and find them on SoundCloud, or you can go to directionpoint.org and find out where they are from there. Um, great, great podcast. They're doing the target books in story order, which is often interesting because the books are different from, from story to story. You might be reading a book written in 74 followed by a book written in 91. So definitely a different thing. So check them out. On my next episode, I will be doing I Say Aeonian, You Say Emeronian. And we're going to talk about the five books that were published in the United States from 1979 through the early 80s that nobody knew about or hardly anybody knew about them because I didn't know about them and I was a dealer in 84. No one even clued me in on those until uh, I found them on Amazon one day. I found Day of the Daleks and Giant Robot on Amazon and I've got the other ones now as well. I've got all, all the books and I will, I will video that so you can see these books because there's some really interesting stories behind these. So check us out for the next episode. And until then, keep collecting. Direction point! Direction point! A Doctor Who Podcast Network.